This is part two of a series that I've entitled Breaking the Law. I started last week. It's a series on the Ten Commandments uh, that will carry us for the next couple of months. Uh, And this week, I want to look at Exodus, second book in the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, chapter 20. Uh, And I want to read simply verses 1 through 3. Exodus chapter 20. This is where the Ten Commandments first appear. They also appear in Deuteronomy, and then Jesus preaches through the Ten Commandments in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. But this is where they first appear. Exodus chapter 20, beginning in verse 1. Then God gave the people all these instructions. I am the Lord your God, who rescued you from the land of Egypt, the place of your slavery. You must not have any other God but me. So last week, I started this series uh, by looking at Matthew chapter 5, which is a little odd because the Ten Commandments appear first in the Old Testament. Uh, And I started a series on the Ten Commandments by looking at a passage in the New Testament. But the reason I started a series on the Ten Commandments by looking at a section of the New Testament is because the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, Jesus' most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus' sermon on the Ten Commandments. So, If we're going to look at the Ten Commandments and try to understand what's going on in the Ten Commandments, we should first ask, how did Jesus understand them? How did did he teach them? And so we looked at Matthew chapter 5. I've preached a sermon series on the Sermon on the Mount before. Um, uh, I think it was last year sometime. But we started in Matthew chapter 5 because that's where Jesus begins his explanation of the Ten Commandments. Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount, to those who thought they were keeping the Ten Commandments. That's who he preached it to. And his goal was to show that God's requirements are far more demanding than we realize. He explains in the Sermon on the Mount how God's law is not a ladder that we climb to get God's favor. Rather, it's an impassable wall that we crash into so that we'll finally admit we can't do it. We can't make it on our own. We need outside help. We need a helper. Martin Lloyd-Jones, who was a very well-known preacher in London in the middle part uh, of the 1900s, middle, late part of the 1900s, once said this about the Sermon on the Mount. He said, the whole point of Jesus's teaching was to show us that it is impossible Have you ever thought about that? His teaching was just to show us that we could not do it. It's not a very popular opinion amongst people who spend a lot of time reading the Bible. They they automatically assume that if a command is given, it implies that we therefore have the power to keep that command. But Lloyd-Jones and Jesus say it's actually just the opposite The whole point of Jesus' teaching, he said, was to show us that it is impossible, was to show us that we could not do it, was to expose us, to unmask us. The problem with the Ten Commandments is not that they require us to be good. Okay, that would be a big enough problem on its own if they required us to be good. But the real problem with the Ten Commandments is that they require us to be perfect, So the first time I ever preached a sermon series on the Ten Commandments, I entitled it, How to Be Perfect. For all of those merit mongers out there who want checklists of things to do to improve their standing with God, I facetiously called the series How to Be Perfect. If you're into gaining perfection or attaining perfection, then this series is for you. But the whole point of the Ten Commandments, the difficulty, the the impossibility of the Ten Commandments is that they require us to be perfect. It's not just requiring us to try hard, to be good, but to be perfect. So no matter how hard we try or how much we may improve ourselves before God, we will always fall short of what he requires. Anything short of perfection is rejected. So that poses a problem for us. If there's nothing we can do, no improvement we can make 
to secure our standing with God, to secure a relationship with God, to secure the favor of God, to secure the love of God, and all of those things, then, then we're in trouble because none of, us, none of us are perfect. And when we don't see this about ourselves, we become judgmental and self-righteous. I think it was Martin Luther who said that the law of God is a divinely sent Hercules to attack and destroy the self-righteousness in us all. When we don't believe that God requires perfection and that we all fall short of that, we become judgmental and self-righteous. I've shared this illustration before, but it's so helpful. It comes from Max Lucado in his book, The Grip of Grace, but he says this, judging others is the quick and easy way to feel good about ourselves. A convenience store ego boost. Standing next to all the Hitlers and Dahmers of the world, we look to God and say, compared to them, I'm not that bad, but that's the problem. God doesn't compare us to them. They aren't the standard. God is. And compared to him, Paul will argue in Romans chapter 3, verse 12, there is no one who does anything good. Suppose God simplified matters and reduced the Bible to one command. Thou must jump so high in the air that you touch the moon. No need to love your neighbor or pray or follow Jesus. Just touch the moon and you'll be saved. We'd never make it. There may be a few who jump three or four feet, even fewer who jump five or six, but compared to the distance we have to go, no one gets very far. Though you may jump six inches higher than I do, it's scarcely reason to boast. Now, God hasn't called us to touch the moon, but he might as well have. He said, you must be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. None of us can meet God's standard. As a result, none of us deserves to stand behind the bench and judge others. Why? Because we aren't good enough. Dahmer may jump six inches and you may jump six feet, but compared to the 230,000 miles that remain, who can boast? The thought of it, he goes on to say, is almost comical. That's what God's law does. It exposes us shows us how far we are from being able to bridge the gap between ourselves and God. A lot of people misunderstand grace to mean the sweeping away of God's high demands. That's what they kind of understand grace to be. They see grace as a lowering of the bar. So be perfect gets cheapened into try hard. Some think that those who talk a lot about grace have a very low view of God's law, that they don't take it very seriously. But it's actually the opposite. Those who take grace most seriously are those who refuse to dumb down God's requirements. In fact, legalism and self-righteousness, the stuff that we hate, we don't like being around that stuff, but legalism and self-righteousness is produced by a low view of God's law because a low view of the law causes us to conclude that we can do it, that we can meet the standard. A low view of the law makes us think the standards are attainable, that the goals are reachable, that the demands are doable. And so we become legalistic and self-righteous about that stuff. We're doing well. Why can't you do better? We're further along than you are. And we find ourselves in the predicament that Max Lucado illustrated. We may jump six inches further. We may jump six feet further. But compared to the 230,000 miles left to go to touch the moon, we all fall woefully short. And so, as Luther said, the law attacks the self-righteousness, assaults the self-righteousness that's in us all. See, grace doesn't cheapen the law or ease its requirements. It simply announces that someone else met those requirements for us. And so maybe you've heard me say this before, that God doesn't serve mixed drinks. He serves two separate shots, law, then grace. Law straight, and then grace straight, no chaser. Um. I mean, Jesus said, listen, you guys have it all wrong. I know the rap on me is that I I don't take God's law seriously enough, that I'm hanging out with all of these bad people, 
all of these reprobates, and therefore you automatically assume that uh, I don't really care about their sin, that I just sort of sweep it under the rug and all of that stuff. But he says, you have it all wrong. I didn't come to abolish the law, he says. I came to fulfill it. And that is our only hope. We need someone to cross the T's and dot the I's for us because we've sucked for a long time at that stuff. We fail. So our relationship with God, and we talk a lot about, and I said it in my prayer, about the unconditionality of God's love. Well, in a sense, there's, a, there's only one reason why God loves us unconditionally, and that's because someone else kept God's conditions for us. And because that substitute kept God's conditions for us, God relates to us unconditionally. Or, as I said it last week, our relationship with God can only be perfectly unconditional because Jesus kept all of God's perfect conditions for us. So we're not, as we make our way through the Ten Commandments, we're not going to dumb this stuff down. We're not going to make it a doable checklist on how to become a better person. Okay, which is a lot of the ways the Ten Commandments are explained, taught, preached. Uh, that's why I said last week that it always makes me chuckle when uh, religious people want the Ten Commandments put up in schools. And I, that wouldn't be a bad idea if we understood why the Ten Commandments exist in the first place. They want to put it up in schools because they think that if kids be familiarize themselves with the Ten Commandments, they'll become better people. And if they become better people, this will become a better world. But that's not the purpose of the Ten Commandments. The purpose of the Ten Commandments is to show us how bad we are, how much we fall short, how much we need Jesus. So we're not going to dumb it down. Uh, we're not going to make it a doable checklist. Uh, we're going to explore the highness of its demands and the ways we fall short, and then explore the radicality of God's grace in meeting those demands for us so that we could be loved and free forever. That's the purpose of this series. The gospel is the good news that the one who makes the demands from us also meets the demands for us. That's probably the simplest way for me to put it. That the gospel is the good news that the one who makes the demands from us also meets the demands for us. That's, that's what it is. That's why it's good news. It's relieving. It's comforting. It's burden lifting. Martin Luther said that the first commandment, don't have any other gods but me, the one I just read, that the first commandment is foundational that it grounds all of the other commandments because failure to keep the first commandment is a failure to keep all the commandments because all of the other commandments are dependent on the first commandment. That was his point. At first glance, it may seem like we do okay with this one. Don't have any other gods but me. And we're like, okay, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not bad at that. I mean, I'm, after all, we're, we're not atheists. I would assume that most of the people either watching or listening or in the room believe in God at some level. So we think, okay, this doesn't really apply to us. Um, but the first commandment is not addressing atheism. It's addressing idolatry. And we're all guilty of that, as I'm about to show uncomfortably. Um, idolatry is, is not what you may think it is. When I was young and I would hear the word idol or idolatry, I automatically thought of these primitive people in far-off lands bowing down to statues and worshiping trees and mountains and stuff like that. Um, but idolatry is anything more important to you than God anything. It's not just the bowing down stuff like I just mentioned. It's anything that is more important to us than God. And you may go, well, there's nothing more important to me than God. Not true. Okay, there are a thousand things. And it's, if, we, you know, took a, if we took a video of us throughout the week, it would demonstrate that there are a thousand things we lean on throughout the week that are smaller than God to invest our lives with meaning and purpose and security and all of that stuff. 
So when we, you know, idolatry is not just anything more important to you than God. It's anything or anyone that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God. In other words, an idol is a counterfeit God. That's what it is. It's anything that is so essential to your life that you'd feel lost without it. Lost. And I've said this before, but we we typically don't know what we are depending on to make life worth living until we lose it. It's then that our idols are typically exposed. We we don't know how much we're depending on the well-being of our kids to make us happy until they go off the deep end. We, We don't know how much we're depending on money to make us feel safe and secure until we lose it. We don't know how much we're depending on other people's approval to make us feel loved until we feel rejected. Now, it's not that things like work and relationships and hobbies and money and loved ones are wrong. That's that's not the point. It's that we all too often depend on these things to give us what only God is capable of giving us. And in that way, they become idols to us. Objects of ultimate worship, things that we need to come through for us if we're going to feel like we matter, if we're going to feel like we can make it. When we turn good things into ultimate sources of meaning, we ruin the good things we were meant to enjoy because we lean into those things with a pressure that they can't handle. They're not capable of delivering what only God can deliver. And so when our kids let us down or our health fades or the job is lost or the dream never comes true, we end up becoming resentful. We trusted in these things to save us, to rescue us, to invest our lives with meaning and purpose and value and security, and they have failed. And so a lot of people, as they get older, become increasingly resentful, and that's because they've lived a life depending on things smaller than God to deliver to them what only God is capable of delivering to them. And as they age, they become increasingly frustrated, increasingly resentful. And that's the reason. As St. Augustine said in his opening prayer in his famous confessions, We were meant for you, O God, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. There is a tremendous amount of restlessness amongst humans inside and outside the church because we're looking behind every tree and under every rock for things that only God is capable of delivering and giving. Um, It's when we depend on these lesser gods to supply us with living water that we end up dying of thirst. But our idolatry goes even deeper than that. Um, I've discovered that what we tend to idolize depends on what we fear. (laughs) So, for instance, if you fear rejection, you will idolize approval. You'll idolize acceptance. I said this a few weeks ago, but some of the nicest people I know are those who are down deep most afraid. They're so polite and they're so nice and they're so deferential because they're scared of rejection. They will be whatever they think you want them to be because they're scared of being abandoned. They fear rejection, so they idolize acceptance. Some of the most frustrated people I know are those who are deep down most afraid because they need things to be a certain way if they're going to feel safe and in control. So if you fear uncertainty, you'll idolize control. If you fear loss, you will idolize security. Oftentimes, you will suffocate the relationships closest to you because you're so afraid of losing it that you you kill it, you smother it. You squeeze it. If you fear insignificance, you'll idolize influence. If you fear loneliness, you'll idolize relationships. You'll depend on relationships to save you. You'll put a pressure on those relationships that those relationships cannot handle. They'll crack. They'll fall apart. If you, if you idol, I mean, if you fear failure, you'll idolize achievement. You'll depend on accomplishments to save you. You have to be an accomplished person because you're so afraid of failure. 
So a question that I asked myself throughout the day yesterday, and I would encourage you to ask it too, is this, how do my current fears reveal what I'm depending on to make me feel safe and secure and loved? First, you have to ask the question, what is it that I fear? And you got to be honest with yourself. You got to take the time and sort of dive deep, go inside and say, where are my fears? What am I afraid of? Really, not just the surface stuff, but the under the surface stuff that produces the surface stuff. Where, what am I afraid of? What are my fears? And then you've got to ask yourself, how, how do my current fears reveal what I'm depending on to make me feel safe and secure and loved? Behind everything we idolize is the fear that without this person or thing, we would be lost. Lost. We would feel like life is chaos. We would feel like we've lost a sense of purpose. In some cases, we would feel like we've lost our very selves, our identity. And that's a miserable and hard and sad way to live. Incredibly hard. Miserable. Sad. You end up being frustrated. It's interesting to me, and I was thinking about this yesterday, that um, growing up when I would hear this commandment, the first commandment, you can have no other gods but me, um, I just I just assumed that um, that God was flexing his muscles in that. Like, I'm God, there is no other. You're screwed if you choose to believe or worship any other God but me. You can't have any other gods but me. Um, but as I thought about it more, and as I've got to know God more over the years, I realized that God doesn't start by saying, don't have any other gods before me because he's insecure and on some ego trip. He starts with that because he loves us. And he knows that trusting in ourselves to secure the love and acceptance and value we crave is an impossible and miserable task. We can never do it. Martin Luther called this the life of an unhappy God, lowercase g, a heavy treadmill-like existence that makes us sad, unsatisfied, and tired. Idols are grace robbers. They rob us from the grace that we were intended to enjoy and revel in. Uh... I am, not that this would be a big surprise to you guys, because I'm pretty honest week in and week out up here. Um, and that's on purpose, by the way. Stacy and I were talking about this yesterday, and I said, you know, the only preaching that I think really matters is usually delivered by a preacher who knows just how desperate he is and then talks about that desperation in front of his church. And not just to say, Yes, I'm not perfect and I'm a sinner, but to really dive deep, it's part of my sermon prep every week is to dive deep inside me and discover those places where I need to hear this stuff and then to expose those places. How are you ever going to know that this stuff is real, that it matters, that it's relevant in your day in and day out life if I'm not up here demonstrating that I need this? So... I, this won't be a surprise to you, but I mean, I'm a, I'm a desperate man. I mean, there are days where I feel like I'm white knuckling it just to get through the day for a thousand different reasons. And if what we say here at the sanctuary week after week isn't true, if Christianity is something different than what we say it is here, I don't have a shot. I'm screwed. And either do you, if any of this stuff, I mean, if the hope of life depends on me, my ingenuity, my endurance, my finding something to fill the inescapable void we all feel, I will be lost and frustrated forever, forever. And I won't experience the freedom that Jesus said we get to experience here and now. I need good news, in other words, not good advice. Good advice is helpful, especially in some practical situations, but at the core of my soul, it's not good advice that I need. It's good news that I need to hear. And the gospel is good news for those who are tired of trying to rescue themselves always trying to control things and manipulate things and, and negotiate things constantly. We've all done it. We all do it. 
We do it in subtle ways and we do it in not so subtle ways. But the gospel is good news. It declares that I don't need to save myself, defend myself, legitimize myself, justify myself. The gospel frees me from the pressure to ensure that everything turns out the way I think it needs to in order to, for me to feel safe and secure. That's good news. That can liberate your relationships. That can liberate your view of work. That can liberate your view of other people. That can liberate your view of yourself. Jenna and I were talking about some of these things the other day, and I said, what it really comes down to, if I were to simplify it and put it in kindergartner's language, it would simply be this. I don't really trust God with everything. I don't. That's what produces fear. That's what fuels insecurities. That's what makes me more controlling. That's what makes me feel like I have to get my way. All of that stuff is that I ultimately don't really trust God. I don't really believe that he's good, that he's working all things out for my good. I don't really believe that he has my best interest at heart. And so I take matters into my own hands all the time, all the time. I take matters into my own hands and I get anxious if things don't go the way I want them to go. And I get frustrated when things don't go the way I want it to go. And I, I just, I become tense, frustrated. That's what it boils down to. Do I really believe that this gospel stuff meets me in my daily life? I mean, I've said it so many times, and I will say it until I die. The gospel is the good news that all of the love and all of the acceptance and all of the approval and all of the security and all of the, the worth and the value that you and I crave at the deepest part of our being has already been delivered to us. We already have it. The keys are already in our pocket. Now, when you take that, into a relationship that's not going well, that you can't seem to get what you think you need out of, it liberates things. It changes things. It makes you more relaxed. It makes you feel the rest that Jesus promised to give us. You may get a little less anxious, maybe a little less afraid, a little less frustrated. See, the gospel frees me from this pressure to ensure that everything has to go a particular way in order for me to feel safe and secure. It frees me from that. Real freedom happens only when the resources of grace smash any sense of need to secure for myself anything beyond what God has already given to me. That's when real freedom happens. Jesus didn't say, come to me and I will show you how to fix yourself. That's not what he said. He said, come to me if you're tired of hiding. Come to me if you're tired of trying to make it on your own. Tired of always having to be in control. Tired of being afraid people won't love you if they see the real you. Tired of keeping up with appearances. Come to me with all that stuff, and I will give you rest. The hope of life rides on the shoulders of another one who succeeded where we fail, one who was strong for us, obedient for us, pure for us, righteous for us, perfect for us, the one who came to do for us and to secure for us what we could not do and secure for ourselves. His grace is sufficient for all of our needs, not just some of our needs, all of our needs, and it takes a lifetime of wrestling to actually believe that stuff. It just seems too good to be true. It doesn't mean that life won't be hard. It, don't, it doesn't mean that we won't suffer and lose in this life. It doesn't mean that there won't be tension and frustration and misunderstanding and failure. It doesn't mean that. What it means is that God sticks and stays with us no matter what. That his commitment to us is not dependent on our commitment to him. That his faithfulness to us is not dependent on our faithfulness to him. That his goodness to us is not dependent on our goodness to him. 
All of those things are dependent entirely and exclusively on what Jesus has done for us, not what we do or fail to do. And so we can say, no matter how hard life is, no matter how difficult things may be, we can say, God's got us no matter what. The one thing I need most, I can never lose, ever. Not because I'm holding on to him, but because even when I let go, he holds on to me. That's the good news of the gospel. And that's why we don't need to be afraid to look at the Ten Commandments for what they are. Am I an idolater? Of course I am. It says it right here. If I get honest with myself and I start looking down deep, I realize my heart is an idol-making factory. And so is yours. But I don't need to be afraid of that stuff. Because at the end of the day, God has done everything needed in order for me to be with him, in order for him to be with me forever. And more than anything else, that's what I need most. That's what I need most. I I love my family and I love my friends and I love the things that I get to do in my life. But if I'm depending on those things to save me, I will put a pressure on those things that will prevent me from actually enjoying those things as the gifts that God has given. Relationships will get harder because you're not acting the way I want you to act. You're not responding the way I want you to respond. You're not doing what I want you to do. I need you to become a certain way if I'm going to be happy, if I'm going to feel safe, if I'm going to be secure, and you're not being that way. You're failing to be my savior. I resent you. And that makes life miserable, absolutely miserable. And it makes the people around us miserable, and it makes us miserable. And so to know to know beyond a shadow of a doubt, even though we struggle with it, I believe, help my unbelief, that is an ongoing prayer of mine, I believe, help my unbelief. I believe, help my unbelief. I believe and I don't believe. I'm good and I'm bad. I'm selfless and I'm selfish. I give and I take. I love and I hate. I am a bundle of contradictions. And so I need constant reminders, constant reminders That no matter how bad and failing I may be, God sticks and stays. And it's the security of that relationship that will get me through to the finish line. 